A quorum being present the Subcommittee on National Security and Foreign Affairs hearing entitled Investigation of Protection Payments for Safe Passage Along the Afghan Supply Chain will come to order. I ask unanimous consent that only the Chairman and Ranking Member of the Subcommittee be allowed to make opening statements up to 10 minutes each, without objection so ordered. I ask unanimous consent that the hearing record be kept open for five business days so that all members of the Subcommittee will be allowed to submit a written statement for the record, without objection so ordered. In our constitutional democracy, Congress is charged with overseeing that the executive branch executes its responsibilities in accordance with the law. Toward that end, this Congress has invested the Subcommittee on National Security and Foreign Affairs with a clear mandate to root out waste, fraud, and abuse wherever we may find it. Real oversight is a powerful tool for transparency and accountability, not for political grandstanding. Today's report by the majority staff represents the best tradition of constructive oversight. After six months, 31 witnesses, 25,000 documents, hundreds of hours of work, and yes, even tea with one of the warlords at the heart of the investigation, the report provides the subcommittee, the Congress, and the American people with significant insight into how the Department of Defense has managed the supply chain for the United States troops in Afghanistan. An investigation of this nature is akin to a puzzle. We have laboriously gathered the pieces on the table, fit together the edges, and filled in enough sections for us to understand what the picture will look like, but there are still portions to be completed. Though the puzzle is unfinished and important questions remain, the portrait that emerges is of the Department of Defense's systematic failure of management and oversight of contractors along the Afghan supply chain. In the past eight years, the United States has placed an enormous burden on our brave men and women in uniform. The military has been asked to fight two grueling conflicts in some of the most difficult and hostile conditions imaginable. The challenge of supplying our troops in the field is simply staggering. To absorb the strain of these burdens, the Department of Defense has increasingly looked to civilian contractors. In some cases, using contractors rather than military personnel makes sense. What initially was a cost-effective expediency, however, has morphed into an institutionalized reliance and a dangerous shortcut. As the Congressional Budget Office put it, the recent increase in the size and scope of contractor support in the battlefield has been unprecedented in United States history. In Afghanistan today, we have roughly 90,000 troops, but reportedly use almost 110,000 contractors. As the Department of Defense has increased its reliance on contractors in conflict zones, it has not sufficiently increased its capability and expertise to manage and oversee those contractors. At the Defense Contract Management Agency, for example, the civilian workforce fell by 60 percent between 1990 and 2006. The combination of a massive increase in contracting and insufficient management and oversight capability is a recipe for disaster. In the case before us today, we have just such a disaster. The Department of Defense outsourced almost all operational components of the supply chain that provides our troops with the food, water, fuel, and equipment they need to do their job. Critically, despite laws and regulations mandating strict oversight of armed private security guards in conflict areas, the Department outsourced management responsibility for those hired gunmen to other contractors. The Department put trucking contractors, many of which only had two or three employees in theater, in charge of procurement, management, and oversight of small armies of private security contractors. The trucking companies were then directed to send their subcontracted trucks and subcontracted security through many of the most dangerous locations on earth while carrying millions of dollars of critical supplies for our troops. According to the report, many in the Department of Defense apparently took comfort in these arrangements. The responsibility for security and risk of loss was on the contractors and their subcontractors. The prevailing attitude seemed to be that as long as the tr trucks got to their destination, don't rock the boat. When problems did arise, the response was to wrap the prime contractors on the knuckle and remind them to follow the terms of the contract. To their credit, many of the contractors immediately recognized that they could not adequately procure, manage, or oversee mass scale security services in Afghanistan, and they raised red flags. They told the military that they were being extorted, making massive protection payments for safe passage, and possibly, quote, funding the insurgency, close quote. These extraordinary warnings appear to have fallen on deaf ears. The contracting offices, contract managers, and relevant regulators consistently responded that the companies just needed to get the trucks to their destination. 
Contractors raised serious concerns about extortion payments, funding warlords, within two days of the contract performance beginning. And here we are, 14 months later, and nothing has changed. Nothing has changed. The benefits of outsourcing trucking and security on the supply chain are clear. No United States troops are put in harm's way, and they can instead focus on their energies on higher priority missions. This report helps us also weigh the cost of contracting out the supply chain. In short, this contract appears to have fueled warlordism, extortion, corruption, and maybe even funded the enemy. United States taxpayer dollars are feeding a protection racket in Afghanistan that would make Tony Soprano proud. Further consideration must now be given to determine whether the Department of Defense's failure to provide management or properly manage or oversee its supply chain logistics contracts has undermined the overall United States mission. In January of this year, Major General Michael Flynn, our principal military intelligence officer in Afghanistan, wrote a public report saying that the United States is largely blind, deaf, and dumb when it comes to understanding local politics, power dynamics, and economic structures within Afghanistan. I would add that the United States is also largely blind, sometimes willfully so, to the corrupting influences of our own contracting and development work. We must be self-aware of how a massive footprint in Afghanistan can affect such a sensitive environment. Before I close, I want to address a recurring retort to this investigation. Some say, this is just the way things are done in Afghanistan. Others have compared the funding of warlords and possibly insurgents in Afghanistan to the Ambar awakening in Iraq. There, General Petraeus used cash and other incentives to strategically co-opt insurgents. Blindly funding warlordism, extortion, and corruption in Afghanistan through multiple layers of invisible subcontracting is no Ambar awakening. If the Department of Defense wants to co-op warlords, strongmen, or insurgents with U.S. taxpayer dollars, military commanders in the field need to take direct responsibility for those relationships in order to ensure absolute accountability. This oversight committee is charged by Congress with the stewardship of American taxpayer dollars and with rooting out waste, fraud, and abuse wherever we may find it. With this report in hand, we intend to hold the Department of Defense accountable to the subcommittee, to Congress, and to the American people. And with that, I defer to uh, Mr. Flake for his opening remarks. I thank the Chairman <clears throat> for holding this hearing, and I thank the Chairman for this uh, very thorough, enlightening, and invest um, I thank you for initiating this uh, very thorough, enlightening, and uh, very sobering uh, investigation. The Chairman has already sub um, summarized the report, so I won't go into detail. Uh, let me just make a couple of broad observations. The counterinsurgency plan that we're employing in, in uh, Afghanistan is dependent on a central government in Kabul uh, that will extend its uh, writ beyond Kabul. This report presents strong evidence that this is not occurring. The uh, counterinsurgency plan we're employing in Afghanistan is dependent on our ability, the ability of our military and those of our NATO partners, to provide security to the Afghan citizenry. This report presents strong evidence that this is not occurring. In fact, it seems that security in any meaningful sense does not extend beyond the security gates of our military bases. I hope that the Department of Defense takes the recommendations contained in this report seriously, but let's face it, even if the recommendations are implemented in their fullness, uh, we're just tinkering at the margins here. In my view, the real value of this report is it presents more irrefutable evidence that our overall strategy in Afghanistan needs to be examined and overhauled. It's not something that can be salvaged with time and troop levels. I look forward to the witnesses' statements. Thank you very much, Mr. Flake. The subcommittee will now receive testimony from the first panel before us here today. Uh, I'll take a moment to just introduce all three before we start the testimony on that. Uh, Lieutenant General William Phillips. Uh, is the Principal Military Deputy to the Assistant Secretary of the Army for Acquisition, Logistics, and Technology, as well as the Director for Acquisition Career Management. He served previously as the Commanding General of the Joint Contracting Command in Iraq and Afghanistan and the Program Executive Officer for Ammunition. Lieutenant General Phillips holds a B.S. from Middle Tennessee State University, an M.S. in Procurement and Materials Management from Webster University, and a Master's of Personnel Management from Troy State University. In 2001, he was named the Army's Acquisition Commander of the Year. Mr. Gary Motzik is the Assistant Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Program Support. 
In his current capacity, Mr. Matzik is the principal advisor to the Office of the Secretary of Defense, leadership on policy and program support to the geographic combatant commands. Previously, he has served as the Deputy G3 for support operations, the Assistant Deputy Chief of Staff for ammunition under U.S. Army Material Command, among other positions within the United States Army and NATO. Mr. Matzik received a B.S. in environmental engineering from Syracuse University, an M.S. in management from Troy State University, and a Level Three certification from the Defense Acquisition University. Brigadier General John Nicholson is the Director of the Pakistan-Afghanistan Coordination Cell on the Joint Staff, where he is responsible for synchronizing the military activities of the services and combatant commands in the region. Previously, he has served in Afghanistan as the Deputy Commanding General for Regional Command South, as part of the International Security Assistance Force and Deputy Director for Operations for the National Military Command Center. General Nicholson has a bachelor's degree from the United States Military Academy and Georgetown University, a master's in military art and science from the School for Advanced Military Studies, and an MA in National Security Studies from the National Defense University. I want to thank all of you for making yourselves available today and for sharing uh, your substantial uh, expertise. It's the policy of this committee to swear in the witnesses before you testify, so I ask you to please stand and raise your right hands. We solemnly swear to uh, or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you. The rec will please reflect that all of the witnesses answered in the affirmative. I think, as you gentlemen know, that your full written uh, statement will be entered into the record by previous agreement of the committee. I would ask you to uh, summarize it, if you could, within as close to five minutes as possible. You'll be able to determine that from the lights before you. Uh, when it's green, you go. When it's amber, you have about a minute left. And when it's red, uh, if you read, if you'd please start to wind up and bring it to a conclusion, so we can have time for uh, people to ask questions as well. Uh, General Phillips, if you would. Microphone, microphone, please. General Phillips, I think we need to have that on. Sorry, sir, I thought it was on already. Uh, Chairman Tierney. Congressman Flake, distinguished members of the Subcommittee on National Security and Foreign Affairs, thank you for this opportunity to discuss the role of the United States Army in the Department of Defense's management and oversight of host nation trucking contract in Afghanistan. I am pleased to represent the Army leadership and the over 40,000 members of the Army acquisition workforce to include contracting and the more than one million soldiers over eight and a half years who have served in combat in support of our country in Iraq and Afghanistan. Most importantly, I have worked the host nation contract as the commander of Joint Contracting Command Iraq and Afghanistan, where we have served greatly to provide supplies, services, equipment at the right place and right time for our soldiers and all our service members. As I mentioned, Mr. Chairman, I had the privilege of serving as Commanding General of Joint Contracting Command, Iraq and Afghanistan. It's also known as JCCIA. Uh, although my duties uh, my, and my office was in Baghdad, I traveled frequently throughout Iraq and to Afghanistan. Uh, let me state from the outset that host nation trucking contract is absolutely vital to the sustainment of our forces in Afghanistan. Contracting for obtaining and overseeing services in an austere environment in a fragile economy with a poor financial system, limited rule of law, and during hostilities is a dangerous and difficult task that is being performed daily throughout Afghanistan. Through the host nation trucking contract, more than 90 percent of our forces in Afghanistan receive food, water, equipment, ammunition, construction materials, and other uh, badly needed supplies. In the last year or since uh, May of 2009, there have been more than 60,000 trucking missions performed by host nation trucking. Each mission is critical and effective means to meet the needs of our warfighters, whose numbers today will soon reach about 90,000 in Afghanistan. Mr. Chairman, in all Army contracting operations worldwide, we strive to be responsive to our warfighters while ensuring proper physical stewardship of taxpayer dollars. Our progress in these areas has been steady, even though ex expeditionary military operations have placed extraordinary demands on the contracting system and our contracting professionals. Upholding the highest ethical standards of discipline and contracting is of paramount importance, sir, as you indicated in your opening comments. And even though we have confidence in the talent and professionalism of our Army's contracting workforce, we remain vigilant at all times. We are working continually throughout the Army to actively 
engage with the Department of Defense to eliminate areas of vulnerability in contracting. During my time in JCCIA, I was deeply committed to maintaining high standards of ethics and discipline in all of contracting operations. My team and I conducted over 11 internal procurement management reviews of regional contracting center operations. And we've identified some of the hard lessons and deficiencies, and we've worked hard to institutionalize those processes uh, inside everything that we do by applying lessons learned. I often refer to my contracting workforce that served in Iraq and Afghanistan as contracting warriors because they serve beside our war fighters in areas throughout Iraq and throughout Afghanistan. Last, last March, uh, another comprehensive procurement management review was undertaken in Afghanistan. The final report is nearly complete. And the findings indicate strongly that contracting officers continue to maintain the highest ethical standards and discipline in their daily work. These positive findings are attributed to the extraordinary talent of our contracting officers. Again, I call them contracting warriors. Uh, sir, there really are five elements that I implemented as JCCIA to work on ethics and discipline in everything that we do. Briefly, first, before they enter theater, they have to complete the Defense Acquisition University ethics training. Second, all personnel upon arrival must attend a newcomer's ethics briefing. Third, all personnel must complete the Depart Department of Defense's standards of conduct annual ethics training. Fourth, the, our judge advocate generals, as they go around theater, also provide ethics training twice a year to every contracting officer. And fifth, during weekly meetings, we focus on ethics. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we are working constantly in, to improve our contracting operations, our education, training, ethics, and discipline in everything that we do. Our progress is significant. The host nation trucking contract is a prime example. We adhere to the statutes under the federal acquisition regulations for open and fair competition while ensuring that our warfighters receive badly needed material and supplies. Mr. Chairman, I assure you that we take the allegations that you've outlined in your opening statement very seriously within the Department of Defense, and we will work hard to fix the areas that we need to work. Sir, uh, thanks to you and this subcommittee for this opportunity to appear before you. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, General. We appreciate your comments. Uh, uh, Mr. Motzek, if you would, please. Chairman Tierney, Ranking Member Flake, and members of the committee, thank you for this opportunity to appear before you today and to discuss the program management and oversight of private security contracts. As the Quadrennial Defense Review acknowledged, contractors are part of the total force, along with military forces and government civilians. And as the Chairman noted, provide an adaptable mix of unique skill sets, local knowledge, and flexibility that a strictly military force cannot cultivate or resource for all scenarios. Contractors provide a broad range of supply, services, and critical logistics support in many capabilities areas while reducing the military footprint and increasing the availability and readiness of resources. Typically, there is a higher reliance on contracted support during the post-conflict phases of an operation. This is especially true in this current operation where we are conducting multiple phases of the operation simultaneously and not sequentially. Current operations in the U.S. Central Command Area of Operations require private security contractors to fulfill a variety of important security functions for the Department of Defense, Department of State, and other U.S. government entities supporting both Iraqi freedom and operation during freedom. Relief, recovery, and reconstruction of post-conflict region and traditional civilian military functions, and thus it is entirely appropriate for civilian resources to be used to protect them. By using civilian resources to accomplish these selected civilian tasks, military, focus, military forces can focus on the military mission. DOD's use of local nationals to perform private security functions support the U.S. CENTCOM commander's counterinsurgency strategy. These local national jobs are central to the COIN operations. In Afghanistan today, 93 percent of DOD contracted PSC employees are local nationals. Many have assumed risk and have sacrificed protecting key movements and facilities and freeing up key combat capability. However, even as the COIN strategy is enhanced by employing local nationals as armed contractors, security and reliability concerns must be considered, especially in countries where there are no reliable databases for traditional vetting and where personnel and company records are limited or non-existent. As required by statute and noted in this committee's report, DOC policies on armed PSCs apply to all employees 
at any contract tier. With the impetus from senior DOD leadership, there has been a concerted effort now to improve the compliance with these policies. A number of significant challenges impact this effort, and DOD is working to address these challenges to facilitate compliance. However, we do acknowledge there are risks and we must address them. In spite of these challenges, DOD policy requires all contract personnel, regardless of nationality, to comply with our DOD regulations, as well as the applicable laws of the United States and the host country. There is no immunity clause to protect contractors from local law. U.S. government PSCs, again, at any tier, are required to comply with host nation registration and be properly licensed to carry arms in accordance with host nation law. DOD employees are also required, consistent with their terms of contract, to obey the orders of the commander in the area in which they are operating. Finally, individual companies have their own standards of conduct, and DOD contractors have generally demonstrated a consistent pattern of terminating employment of individuals who violate these standards. On a whole, U.S. PSCs are operating in accordance with host nation laws and support the overall COIN objectives. The intent of the Ministry of Interior in Afghan is to transition in the future most of the security functions presently performed by PSCs to the Afghan National Police as it matures. We take any allegations of corruption seriously, and to my knowledge, we have several organizations charged with investigation, and we will take action on those that can be legally documented with the appropriate level of forensic evidence. The DOD, excuse me, we'll just zip by that. Contractors employed to perform security functions for DOD are only a fraction of the total private sector security, public, private, and international in the CENTCOM area of responsibility. Many of the same contractors the U.S. employ also perform for other countries, the host nation, non-government organizations, and private organizations. This is one of the principal reasons that OSD is supporting the initiative to move beyond the Montrose document and implement an industry-led, government-supported, internationally accountability regime that will apply to all PSCs in all in, uh, operational environments. This will change the present paradigm of primarily relying on the MOI, Ministry of Interior license with an independent third party to assess compliant with the standards. I believe the committee's efforts have been instrumental in getting into the uh, House version of the 2011 NDAA language that requires this third party certification in the future, and I welcome it and I thank you for that. Whether or not the U.S. government employs PSCs, they will always be PSCs in the contingency area. The draft standard that I've just referred to has been developed and is being refined by a working group drawn primarily from the U.S., the U.K., and the Swiss government with participation from the private security industry and non-governmental organizations active in human rights and the law of armed conflict. The aim of this is to standardize the principles and to attain an accountability mechanism later this year. I thank you and will be happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you, Mr. Matzek. And uh, General Nicholson, if you would, please. Uh, Chairman Tierney, uh, Ranking Member Flake, and uh, other members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss how we can better link contracting and the flow of U.S. government contracting funds to a winning counterinsurgency strategy in Afghanistan. The focus of our COIN strategy in Afghanistan is the Afghan people. This population-centric counterinsurgency operation is uh, rests on a couple of principles. One, enabling an expanded and effective Afghan National Security Force, securing the population in key areas, and then connecting the government of Afghanistan to its people through improved governance and economic development. So optimizing the effects of our contracting dollars in support of this approach is crucial to our success. In order to do that, in order to more effectively link U.S. contracting to desired operational effects in a winning coin strategy, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff uh, directed the establishment of Task Force 2010. It has been chartered by the Commander of U.S. Forces in Afghanistan. Task Force 2010 will improve visibility of U.S. contracting flows in Afghanistan in order to ensure that U.S. dollars can complement the COIN campaign more effectively. 
This improved visibility of the contract funds will provide awareness on how money flows from contractors to subcontractors to tribes, factions, individuals. This is no easy task, and it involves an integrated effort at all levels to gain visibility of the money flow, understand and shape perceptions of the Afghan people, correct the behavior of some Afghan contractors, and gain an awareness and a level of control over the second order effects of U.S. contract spending on the environment. Task Force 2010 is led by Rear Admiral Kathleen DeSalt, U.S. Navy, a former commander of the Joint Contracting Command Iraq and Afghanistan. She is in the country now. She is leading an experienced forward deployed task force of about 25 planners, intelligence analysts, auditors, contracting experts, law enforcement personnel, and strategic communication specialists. They will integrate with other efforts in the theater, including the Threat Finance Cell and the Anti-Corruption Task Force. We've established working groups in the Pentagon, to, to provide reachback support for her task force in the areas of financial intelligence, contracting policy, and in coin effects. Contracting provides, uh, and, I, and I speak now, sir, as a, as a customer of contracting, as a former commander in Afghanistan, contracting provides much needed products and services to our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines. Contracting for uh, products and services such as host nation trucking reduces the risk for our servicemen and women. Given that 60% of our casualties in Afghanistan are caused by IEDs, it's logical that the fewer service members are on the road, the fewer service members are exposed to the threat of IEDs, and then ideally the fewer become casualties. Contracting in the Afghan First policy has the great potential to produce very positive coin effects. Job creation, capacity building, providing for business growth, all necessary to create a self-sustaining Afghan economy, an economy that's been racked by 30 years of war. The key here, uh, from our perspective, is optimizing the positive effects of our, co of our contracting investment while sustaining the positive effects uh, for our uh, service members. And so we look forward to working with the committee to, to achieve this improved capability and optimizing the effects of those uh, contracting uh, dollars in country. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank all of you for your testimony. Uh, I want to set a tone here of respectfulness because we do respect all of the service uh, that you gentlemen have given to your country, and, and we do that very sincerely, and I want to make sure that we do that. Uh, I, I listened to some of the testimony with a little bit of incredulity, uh, not because I doubt anybody's intention uh, or the, you know, the hard work that went into a lot of the systems that were set up. Uh, I do have an issue with how anybody could think that it's actually being carried out on the ground that way, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit. Uh, General Nicholson, I think you get it. Uh, listening to your testimony, uh, the idea here is you have two choices. One, either that we're, we've got the wrong strategy, uh, and then we have to look at that. If that's the case, how are we going to do this uh, other than the way that we're doing it now? And the other is if you're going to continue on with this strategy, the other option is how do you get better management uh, and better oversight involved into it, which clearly from this report is not there. Uh, so I thought your comments were the most directly addressing the situation that we have it. Uh, but General Phillips, let me start with you, if I can, uh, on a question. Uh, and I've got a chart, I think on page 12 of our report, we have a little chart to sort of see where you gentlemen fit in on this because it gets to be a little uh, convoluted. But uh, General Phillips, you are the Army Acquisition Executive. You're right now the Principal uh, Military Deputy to the Army Acquisition Executive. Yes, sir. Right? So you directly beat the Secretary of the Army's office. You were the Joint Contracting Command for Iraq Afghanistan, which would be uh, now reports to you, I guess would be the case in that. Sir, not directly to not me. Directly. I am not in the chain of command for okay. the Commanding General of JCCIA. Okay. It would flow through CENTCOM, but the contracting authority actually flows through Mr. Ed Harrington. Uh, who works for Dr. O'Neill, the Army Acquisition Executive. I, I am not in that chain all of command. Right. So, all right. so let me talk to you as the former JCCIA, as, as you say. Yes, sir. On that. Um, under the terms of the host nation contract, there are eight prime contractors, and they're required to provide security for their trucks and the supplies that are carried uh, in those trucks. The security provisions on the contract specify about six security vehicles and 24 guards as armed security for every 20 trucks. The host nation trucking companies run up to about 8,000 truck missions per month that require the procurement, management, oversight of a small army of, of thousands of Afghan security guards. So my question to you is, do you believe it's appropriate to have trucking contractors, many of which only have two or three at most of their employees in theater, and they have never been on the road, do you believe it's appropriate to have them managing and overseeing thousands of armed security guards in a war zone? Sir, under, uh, under the host nation contract, uh, contract that we have with those eight vendors, 
part of that, as you just described, is that they provide their own private security. Uh, and then they go out and subcontract for that, uh, which is allowable under the terms and conditions of the contract that we put into place. No, but I guess my question is, how appropriate is, once you do that, I know you sort of this, uh, the Swaz thing of saying, like, all right, that's done. You yes, know, sir. Give it to them and they're off. It's all on their shoulders now. But when we know that there's only two or three people in their company that are in country and that they've never been out on the road, do we think that that's the appropriate oversight and management here? So it's important that, that when we vetted each of those contractors up front before we actually signed the host nation contract, it was important that we uh, make sure that they had the right management in place. So you thought the two or three was sufficient, or you didn't know the two and three were the, all the So bad. when we make the award, we clearly uh, considered the management structure of each one of those eight contractors sufficient in terms of being able to oversee the so operations. So I, I want to pin theater. you down a little bit here if I can. So you thought the two or three were sufficient to oversee those thousands of Afghan security guys, because that's all they had. Did you not know that's all they had, or did you think that'll be just fine, two or three is fine? So, sir, at that time, I had no visibility into how many people, have, for, at my level, how many people actually were involved in the day-to-day -day management of... And, and I guess part of the problem is nobody seems to have had visibility into that. Because if you read the report, you get down is that even people between you and those contractors could never tell you who was doing it. Sir, I can, I can assure you that the principal assistant, assistant responsible for contracting in Afghanistan, that's, that's Park A, the colonel that ran it, as well as a contracting officer, used a very rigorous source selection evaluation criteria when they looked at, there were 35 initial vendors mm -hmm. who submitted proposals for the host nation trucking contract. When we looked at it initially, we narrowed that down to 10 vendors. And we looked at technical capability, managerial experience. They looked at past performance as well as past experience, uh, security, how they plan to execute security, and all of and price. Price was a key factor, but all those factors went into the final decision so, to select them. Uh, I guess I'm still unclear, though, whether the criteria of two or three people in that company to manage the whole thing was okay with them, or they didn't know that. Did they not know that they were paying warlords to do some of it, or did they think that that was okay, it's a cost of doing business? Those are the things I think we need to ask. Sir, I, I can't answer your question. I would have to go back and look at the, the actual decision that was made for the source selection and determine, uh, based upon the bids of those contractors, the exact management structure of each one of them. Uh, I personally can't recall a discussion whether there were two or three or, or more within the management structure of the eight prime vendors uh, to manage host nation trucking. Well, when you were the JCCIA, the Joint Contracting Command uh, for Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, were you aware that prime contractors were regularly complaining that they were, uh, they were making p protection payments for safe passage, I quote, or possibly f uh, funding the insurgency? Did that ever get to your attention? Sir, I was personally not aware of that. Mr. Flake. Thank you. Um, General Phillips, uh, can you tell me how many times uh, you, the Department of Defense has, has gone outside of the gates to actually ride with some of these convoys or these, uh, these shipments going from base to base? Sir, the, uh, the contracting officer representatives that work for the 419th Movement Control Battalion, uh, very rarely will they go, they go outside uh, the fence line in terms of monitoring the, the operations. But what they do that through is through the in, in transient visibility that's on board about 84 percent of the vehicles that operate in and out. Now beyond that, just, uh, if, they're, if, if they are transporting uh, op, uh, things like MRAPs, we will have uh, government military that will accompany those convoys for items like MRAP or high visibility items. Sir. How often is that? Sir, I don't know. I'd have to take that for the record and, and get you an answer. It's whenever they're moving heavy equipment like MRAPs or MATVs in and out of theater, they'll put a military, normally they'll put a military convoy with that. I don't know exactly how often, sir. Um, if you could get back to us on sir, that, that would be we'll helpful. Do. Um, uh, in the times that you have been off base, uh, any Department of Defense officials, uh, have you witnessed any of, the, uh, uh, any of the activities that have been detailed in the report? No, sir. I, I do not have any personal knowledge, or has it been presented to me of, of those allegations occurring? I do know there's an ongoing investigation that uh, General Nicholson mentioned up front uh, that is that continues to try to determine what the, the facts are associated with uh, the allegations uh, that were discussed earlier. So, 
the investigation is ongoing by CID. I've had discussions with them, and I know they continue to pursue it very aggressively. Mr. Motzak, you um, mentioned that uh, that people at all levels of the contracting process have to abide by the regulations of uh, DOD, which includes uh, no uh, up-armored uh, convoys, nothing more than an AK-47, I believe, is supposed to be carried along. Um, are you aware of, uh, or do you dispute the findings of this report uh, that, that indicate that, uh, that virtually every uh, convoy that goes out uh, is guarded by subcontractors uh, who carry uh, things far in excess of what the Department of Defense allows? So, sir, the, uh, uh, let me ask, answer that part of the question first. Uh, uh, generally speaking, uh, PSCs by the fragmentation order, fragmentary orders issued by the commander in the field are restricted to uh, what we, you and I would consider small arms. However, it is not a unilateral stop. Uh, uh, when I read the report, I haven't had a chance to research this, but when I read the report, there, there, is, a, there is a process to go to the arming office that the, uh, that the commander has in the field, the four-star commander has in the field, to uh, be authorized to carry weapons beyond a 7.62 or uh, a 5.56 five, or a 9-millimeter uh, small arm. So that's, that's, one, that's one part of it. So generally speaking, the vast majority of our uh, PSCs in Afghanistan and Iraq, quite frankly, carry small arms, as you correctly mentioned. So uh, that, that uh, picture there of that truck uh, with the armaments there, that would be in violation of the I, I can't tell you. Sp I saw that picture this morning. I cannot tell you specifically yet that's in violation because there is a possibility that that contractor had the authority, uh, request and received authority to carry additional weapons. Can you tell me how, how many people, anybody at DOD has interviewed uh, beyond the prime uh, contractor level, under the prime contractor level? Uh, as we know from the report, that the prime contractors rarely know who even provides the security, uh, the subcontractors below them. Has DOD interviewed anyone uh, beyond the prime contractors? At, at the DOD level, sir, I am not aware of anyone that did that. Uh, and it also brings up the second question that you, you, you brought up earlier. The, the challenge I think we have had is that we have relied uh, on the licensing process that the uh, Minister of the Interior had. Uh, Minister Atmar, the, the previous Minister of the Interior, uh, was very aggressive in, in trying to make that the standard to the, to the extent we were restricted to the number of companies we could operate with, the numbers of of contractors they could have. Uh, as I told you in my opening testimony, however, I feel that that's insufficient. We need this third party. In my remaining seconds, I just want to say, I, I mean, if you haven't uh, ridden along with the convoys, very, very rarely, if ever, and if you haven't interviewed anybody beyond uh, the prime contractor, then it's tough to, to know what's really going on. Um, and uh, beyond that, uh, it just, it, it seems that uh, we, I would feel a lot better to hear somebody say, hey, this is the price of business in Afghanistan. This is all we can do. We can't be like the Soviets who devoted three quarters of their force structure to protecting supply routes. That would be, it's not the most efficient way. We understand that. But just to say it's not occurring, we don't see it, so it must not be occurring, that, that just seems a little uh, too much to hear. Thank you, Mr. Flake. Mr. Foster. Yeah, and I'd like to start, if I may, by yielding back um, such time as the chairman may consume for a, a follow-up. Thank you. I appreciate that. I just wanted to make one point, if I could. Uh, Mr. Motzer, the, the fact of the matter is the records indicate in the production documents that request was sought for authorization of heavier up armor and denied on that. But that truck that you see over there, the emblem on the front of it is wanton risk management, and that in the back is a Dishka 50 caliber rifle, which is certainly not authorized on that. Uh, and Commander Rahula, when asked about whether or not he was in compliance with the regulations, response was, what regulations? I don't know if I might. I yield back to Mr. Foster. Thank you. Um, first, um, do contractors receive, contractor truck convoys receive any level of tactical support, air support, um, this sort of thing? And, and, and could you contrast what a, a contractor truck convoy looks like compared to a military? Um, you know, with U.S. troops, and in terms of the support it gets and the procedures, with, with the with the exception of medevac, uh, medical evacuation, 
uh, generally speaking, the uh, there is no additional support provided a uh, a private uh, or a commercial shipment as it, as it transits. Uh, they they don't have the capability of calling close air support of, or something of that nature. Depending upon where you are in the country, uh, if there is an issue, you can request support, but it's not it's not normally part of the package. Part of our challenge and part of our responsibilities uh, as the U.S. forces is to make a threat assessment each and every time uh, that you're going to authorize a, a convoy to go out. And the commander on the ground uh, has to weigh whether or not the risk assessment, the force protection requirements are such that he will uh, permit the movement or not permit the movement. And that's generally the process that they use to, uh, to maintain a, a an overall security package around the, the convoy. A military convoy is clearly clearly that its 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 forces are uh, are uh, indigenous. They're they're military forces uh, operating under rules of engagement, not on the rules of use of force. Uh, the primary difference is that if a military convoy is attacked, uh, let me step back. Generally speaking, if a civilian convoy is attacked, uh, their mission is to leave. Their mission is to protect themselves, but to egress the area as rapidly as possible. A military convoy, because it is a military operation uh, operating under rules of engagement, may elect to close with the enemy and uh, engage in, in, in combat. So there is a profound difference in, in what could happen after the attack. But, but and, and there are infrequent times, as General Phillips noted, when we have mixed convoys out there where the military and a, a, a civilian convoy are mixed. And in those in, instances, to my knowledge, they are clearly under pure military control. The, the military exert, exerts uh, the authority over the whole convoy movements and stoppages. Again, the PSCs are not to operate in an offensive mode. Yeah. yeah, so what I was um, fishing for, maybe more explicitly, is whether a higher level of support for the for the um, civilian contractors, you know, might um, teach the bad guys a lesson, um, so to speak, that it is not a good idea to go and um, and attack the the non-U.S. military convoy. And has, has that been tried? Are there um, do you have any comments on whether or not that's a useful strategy? Thanks to take that. Yes, sir. Uh, generally. Uh, we, we have not done that with ISAF forces. However, the Afghan forces, Afghan police and Afghan army might be the first responders in the case of a host nation truck or convoy that would uh, encounter problems. And, and as um, Mr. Matzik uh, mentioned, in cases of medical evacuation being required, and then if we received a call from an Afghan police unit or military unit that there were injured civilians, then we, we might respond to that based on the uh, specific conditions of the uh, incident. Um, yeah, do we, for example, do we even monitor the roads for unauthorized checkpoints, things like that, which I presume could be done from, from the air? Yes, sir. The, uh, the military, for ISAF and Afghan forces are doing partnered operations across uh, Afghanistan now, and the uh, Part of that is the police and the army enforcing the, the rules, uh, laws of the state. Uh, as, uh, as you're probably aware, the uh, MOI has been seeking to certify these private security companies. So Afghan police or military would certainly question if they see weapons and they didn't know who they were, they would typically you know, try to ascertain, are these, is this an authorized force with these weapons? You know, do they have that kind of authorization? I, I would also mention uh, President Karzai has indicated a desire to reduce the number of private security contractors, and given that the Congress has funded the growth of the Afghan security forces, military and police, to 300,000 by the end of 11, he set that, that rough target date as a time to legitimize these private security companies. So th there has been an expression of will on the part of the Afghan government to reduce uh, the number of private security contractors on the battlefield commensurate with the growth that, that we're enabling in their own security forces so they can exercise their sovereign responsibilities as a nation to secure within their own borders. Thank you. I'm seeing the red lights on. Thank you. Mr. Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I'll ask the best questions I can. Uh, I would note that 
if the majority report had come out before 10:30 last night, it would have been easier for our committee to have all questions available. Additionally, Mr. Chairman, uh, there appears to continue to be an absence of any written transcription of many of the interviews. Uh, are there written transcriptions that can be made available to us, or only the notes from uh, oral testimony? Yielding for that? Yes, sir. Okay. Was it? As you know, uh, there were transcriptions we talked about at the outset of that, and Mr. Flake and I, the ranking member, uh, were in agreement that we would proceed and take notes at those hearings. All of your uh, meetings was about one, and, and that was by the staff's own choice, were attended by both majority and minority staff. Notes were produced of that uh, after that to both minority and uh, minority staff, and in six months, we have not heard back any comments on the notes about whether they were uh, not inclusive, or whether there was an error, whether there was an edit everything on that basis and proceeded, of course, with the assumption that uh, everything was acceptable on that. Uh, and so the report uh, may not have come out until last night, although we gave the minority an opportunity to work with us on the, the report and assume that they were doing their own. That turns out not to be the case uh, and did not do their own briefing earlier today either. I thank the Chairman. Reclaiming my time, uh, <clears throat> General Phillips, uh, if there were transcriptions uh, and they showed any level of criminal activity, would that aid in the uh, Department of Defense uh, making such changes, including criminal prosecutions? And if not, are you able to work on oral or wrote notes from oral testimonies equally well? Sir, again, we take the allegations very, very seriously. And I think if, if that information. But do you take them as seriously when they're notes as you would if they were verbatim transcriptions? Yes, sir. Uh, if there were facts and evidence that was made available to CID or to us that there was criminal activity or uh, bribery or those kinds of things that are ongoing uh, within the host nation trucking contract, I would assure you that, that under my command, the contracting officers would have taken uh, uh, quick action to address the situation. And during my one, if I could add real quickly, during course, my General. one year in Iraq, we took uh, numerous actions to, to do show cause notices, uh, cure notices, and letters of concern to contractors when they would step out of line and violate the rules and regulations, terms and conditions of our contracts. Thank you. Uh, General Nicholson, you're, you're the lucky man here today. It appears as though making sure that our two allies, Pakistan and Afghanistan, do their job in the war on terror falls to you. Is that correct? The coordination of that. Yes, sir. I'm responsible to synchronize the uh, activities of the Joint Staff and the services and execution of this campaign strategy. Yes, sir. Now, in, in World War II and Korea, Vietnam, there were civilian contracts for transport of military goods and military support goods, just as there is in Afghanistan, correct? Yes, sir. I believe so. Did we ever pay tribute to the enemy, like the Viet Cong, in order to move our goods uh, safely to our troops? If that occurred, I'm not aware of it, sir. So would it be reasonable to say that you have communicated to both our allies, Pakistan and Afghanistan, zero tolerance for any monies uh, being skimmed off or paid in order to provide safe, safe transport? Sir, uh, the, our intent uh, to not pro provide any aid or assistance to the enemy is very, very clear to no, our I, allies. I, I was more specific. Yes, sir. The Pakistan government and military, the, pa the Afghan government and military, are they aware of that expectation of zero tribute, whether, t whether directly to aid the enemy or simply skimming off for purposes of funding uh, uh, individuals of some rank in their governments? Sir, I would think so. I'd ha I would have to go back and check with the commanders on the ground who do that coordination to, if, if you wanted specifics of that. But do you have a written policy delivered to those two governments making it clear that we consider it a breach of our relationship at the ally if any money is skimmed off by any government person and not rigorously enforced? I have to defer back to on the contracting side with respect to uh, financial arrangements. Sir, yes, General. Sir, we would we would take action if we had any ev again if we had any evidence that there was general that, kind that of wasn't activity. the question. The question was as to our two allies, we're funding both Pakistan and Afghanistan to a huge amount, and although they're slow, Afghanistan is expected to ramp up a huge amount of troops, troops capable of 
riding alongside with guns to protect convoys and do so at no additional cost beyond the support we give them of weapons, food, ammunition, uh, radios, the works. Is there a record, a documented written record of our dealing both militarily and at the government level to that expectation that there will be no skimming, no payola, no uh, payment, whether it goes to the enemy or simply goes to connected people in their governments? Sir, so under Afghan first policy within Afghanistan, which was my authority during my tenure there, our contracts and our clauses prohibited that kind of activity. Uh, and if it's brought to our attention, we would not tolerate it. We would take action. Mr. Chairman, I, I don't want to belabor the point. My time has expired. Yes, but has. I would like the answer to, has that been communicated to the government? Not the question of, is it in the contract with the various people contracted? The, the answer is not responsive to the question. I apologize, but I would like that answer. Well, if any of you gentlemen feel that you want to change your answer or add to it, I'll give you the moment to do that. Otherwise, we'll move on and we can pursue that afterwards. We're we're stuck because we're not policy folks. Uh, I don't know is yeah, acceptable. Yeah, we don't know if the government has received that in writing. Would be okay I, if you I, don't I, know. And we would have to take that for the record to find whether we physically. If you would, that. I'd appreciate you it. Would, but the be fact, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Quigley, you have uh, recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, I've been here uh, 14 months now, <clears throat> and uh, this is the kind of work that uh, the committee should be about. Uh, so I applaud your efforts and your staff efforts. <clears throat> Gentlemen, put yourself in our place. Um, I understand your lack of awareness of what was taking place, but what would concern if you or us, what would concern you is the fact that it took the committee and staff to ask these questions. Now, s sir, you call them allegations, they're called findings here, but either way, <clears throat> At least they were asking the right questions. Um, were you aware that any of these questions were asked at all by anybody else within your command? Sir, I'll start and then uh, let my teammates uh, join in. Uh, under host nation trucking, I was not personally aware of the kind of allegations that are, that are being made. But I have to say that we take them seriously, just as you and this committee have taken them seriously. When the allegations are presented, uh, we need to research them, determine what the facts and the evidence are, and then to take, have the evidence that we can take hard actions, whether it's contractually or legally in some kind of way, and then eventually I would assume go back and work with the government of, of Afghanistan. So I guess my message to you is understanding where the committee is today and the report that was issued last night or this morning, uh, we do take those allegations seriously and we will work them uh, accordingly within the Department of Defense. So I can't comment on the specific uh, findings of the of the report uh, because I was I was not aware of them. However, for example, I took the uh, Commission of Wartime Contracting to Afghanistan in December, and I participated in the briefing with one of the anti-corruption task force was, uh, briefings to them by CID. So uh, I was aware that there was a broad spectrum of investigations ongoing. Uh, inside of Afghanistan uh, to root out corruption. Uh, I, I was aware that, uh, that CID was taking uh, many allegations seriously. Uh, I was also aware that many, many allegations uh, they could not legally substantiate uh, and, and get on with that. And I was also aware, as we were told, that, the, uh, that they had transmitted to the Afghan government their, their concern and that the uh, anti-corruption court had just started, if I recall, correctly and they've since then had two prosecutions and, and convictions there. Hey sir, if I could add one real quick. Uh, uh, I was referring to legal substantiation of evidence that we could use within our contracts to take action and I don't think anyone would argue with that, that there is corruption that exists inside Afghanistan and I think that's pretty clear if you uh, look at what some of the senior leaders have said both within the Department of State and Department of Defense. Uh, but in contractual actions against contractors, we always look for the hard evidence that we can stand behind to take action to correct behavior or to terminate a contract. Well, and I guess the line, gambling at Rick's, I'm shocked, comes to mind. I mean, we're talking about Afghanistan, arguably the most corrupt country in the face of the earth. Getting back to my original point, if you have that mindset going in, 
you would assume that there would be overlaying, overlapping areas of oversight to ask these questions all the time. And I understand that there are folks who are concerned perhaps about a criminal investigation or investigations that require change. But at some point, you get a pretty good idea that there's a problem and you want to act regardless of having not meeting the burden, perhaps, of a criminal court or a civil court, but recognizing where you are and what's taken place so far. And, and again, back to the, why weren't questions like this asked by, by DOD earlier? Sir, I can offer uh, another perspective on that. Having been in southern Afghanistan last year, we introduced 20,000 U.S. troops into southern Afghanistan last year, a significant increase in the amount of host nation trucking and contracting to support that inflow of forces. So as we did that, the commanders on the ground are primarily concerned about did the product or service get delivered on time? And they, and they don't have the visibility on what happened in, in route to that point. But as these intelligence reports began to come in, as has been indicated in your, in your committee study, uh, these were referred to U.S. Forces Afghanistan, who then had enough anecdotal information to warrant requesting assistance from the Criminal Investigation Command to begin uh, an investigation to determine if there were violations. That eventually uh, increased into the introduction of a, of a CID task force uh, to, to really uh, ramp up the investigation, which is still ongoing, to make that determination. So in answer to your question, sir, these reports have flown in and commanders have forwarded them to the appropriate authorities to begin th this kind of investigation. In, in, in Afghanistan, as you point out, there is a lot of corruption. In southern Afghanistan, there's at least six major drug trafficking organizations. So we have a nexus of criminality uh, and insurgency that occurs down there. So there is, there is a significant amount of criminality there and we are always looking at the linkages uh, between criminality, insurgency and the government. Uh, in fact, have established special intelligence task forces to look at these linkages, which then feed into our anti-corruption task force and our major crimes uh, task force. These task forces have successfully arrested and are now prosecuting some Afghan government officials. So it's, it's not at the level we would like to see it, but it has begun, and we're assisting the Afghans in, in getting after this corruption. And I close, Mr. Chairman, I, and I do thank the gentleman. I, I well, we can only begin to understand how complex the chore is, but I, I do hope there are some lessons learned. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Quigley. Uh, Mr. Welch, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I want to repeat your remarks. I uh, am amazed at your capacity to get goods from here to there. I mean, I don't think the American people have any appreciation for how incredibly, incredibly complex it, uh, and difficult it is. So uh, thank you very much for your work. Uh, the big question, I think, is is uh, is is whether, in in the accomplishment of that and in the doing of that, uh, the approach that's been chosen by others, not by you, uh, essentially to pay two billion dollars uh, to a half a dozen or so private contractors, uh, who then transport and provide security uh, uh, to equip our soldiers, is the right approach. Uh, or would it be better uh, to do what uh, frequently has been done in our history, and that is to assign that responsibility uh, to ISAP and the Afghan Security Force, where they would be under the direct control and supervision um, of our commander? Uh, uh, and and uh, I'd be interested in your opinions about the pros and cons of each approach. And uh, I guess I'll start with you, Mr. Mostek, because people are looking at you. But uh, I want to I want to give deference here to our uh, men in uniform as well. Sir, as, as General Nicholson said, the uh, uh, we don't believe that the uh, Afghan security forces are clearly mature enough to take over this mission. In a perfect world, they in fact this would be their responsibility. This is this is the normal securing of your inner states, if you will. Okay, so will let, let me just stop there, because I think that is an issue. I accept your judgment on that, that they're not in a position to do it now, and this is something that we can't mess around with because our soldiers need what you're delivering. But on the other hand, is there a collateral consequence that since we're giving this to a half a dozen contractors who in turn hire a thousand uh, guys with guns, uh, that there is a down the road uh, counterforce to what we hope will be the force of Afghan security forces. Can so you, you comment on that? So you, you, raise, you raise the key issue, as, as the chairman <coughs> alluded to, uh, and your report alludes to it. Uh, we built a template where 
the responsibility to secure your convoy was a subcontracted responsibility. We made that decision in the host nation trucking uh, contract. Uh, conversely, with log cap in Iraq, we told KBR they were not responsible for the security that the uh, U.S. government would contract separately for, con for the private security contractors to manage that. So we took a template and we're living with that template now. I'm here to tell you that we have to relook at both ways. Uh, it, it may be appropriate. Uh, no, I, I appreciate you saying that. And again, that's not your call. Because again, I, I think the chairman made it very clear. We've got to get that stuff to our soldiers. Okay. However we get it there, it's got to be done. There's no compromising on that. Uh, but there are consequences to how we do it. Uh, I mean, we, we, obviously you would have great confidence in the ability of our soldiers if we had enough to deploy uh, to provide the security and transport the equipment. It would be at some risk to them, uh, and they're in risk, uh, obviously, in theater now. Uh, but uh, perhaps I'll ask you, General, if you could comment on that. So I can only address it really from the perspective of the requirement and flowing in. When we originally built the, we didn't build the requirement, but the warfighters in Afghanistan, we thought we would have a need for about 100 trucks per day. And as you just described, the need for equipment, supplies, ammunition, fuel, water, et cetera, that grew to well over 200 trucks per day or 200 mm -hmm. missions per day. So it grew exponentially over time. And we first signed the contract in March of 09. There were about 30,000 troops that were in Afghanistan about, and it was growing to about 60,000. Now we're growing to about 90,000. So you can see the tremendous growth and the need to have this capability. Now the other piece of it is the Afghan National Army and Police. President Karzai, uh, there was made a declaration through the government uh, a while ago that said we wanted to migrate all private security contractors to the Afghan National Police or Afghan National Army or another government agency. And they wanted that to occur within two years. I think we're about six months down the road toward that piece. Uh, not my lane in terms of operation, but it's going to take some while for us to build uh, up the appropriate forces to be able to take over that private security mission to include convoy escort. Well, G General Nicholson, I, I'll ask you, uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, here's a worry I have, and I just ask you to comment on it. If while we're trying to make that transition, and I know that's the policy and there's great effort uh, being put into it by General McChrystal and others to have the, uh, the Afghan National uh, Army and the uh, uh, take over more responsibility. But as we're doing it over this two-year timetable, uh, there's a $2 billion contract that is going to basically f a private individuals who then now have under their command and dependent on them for uh, millions of dollars uh, a separate army. Are those two developments incompatible? That is, on the one hand, wanting to build up capacity in Afghanistan under the control of the government, while at the same time we're providing an enormous uh, financial incentive to a private army, uh, which is not going to lightly uh, give up the benefits of these uh, contracts. General? Sir, I, I'd add, we, we view this as a temporary necessity uh, until we build their security forces uh, to the level necessary so that they can take over the security. For example, the Afghan National Army is creating what they call highway security CANDACs right now. So they're beginning to field these units and then they're being positioned along the highways to provide additional security. Uh, sir, the, we all share this concern about additional armed groups in Afghanistan. The, the international community went to great lengths at the beginning of the war to disarm the various armed groups through the DIAG process. And we don't want to take a step back towards rearming people or creating regional power brokers uh, <coughs> with guns. Mm -hmm. so, so we share this concern, and this is, gets to the positive second order coin effects that we're referring to. Hence the creation, or hence uh, President Karzai's guidance to re on the reduction of armed group or the reduction of uh, private security contractors, the growth of the ANSF, and the uh, and the focus within the command on what we call freedom of movement, mm -hmm. which is providing uh, the ability of, of for the Afghan economy to move freely along the roads within the country. Okay. So, so this is a priority of the command, sir, and we share your concern. Well, I want to thank the witnesses for your testimony and yield back. Thank you. Uh, on that, be, uh, Mr. Murphy, you're recognized for five minutes, please. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, and uh, uh, let me join Mr. Welsh. And um, 
appreciating the complexity of the task of moving people and goods when Mr. Welsh and I, Mr. Tierney, were in Afghanistan. Last year, we listened to um, agricultural ministers explain to us that for a simple agricultural shipment, uh, um, a particular farmer or the entity that they were contracting with were being stopped 20 to 25 times along that route for varying forms of illegal uh, payments and tributes and bribes. I can't imagine the added complexity um, when you're dealing with uh, security concerns of national, uh, of military shipments, uh, military convoys. Um, my question, I guess, uh, to you, Mr. Motzik, is on the issue um, of the reports that uh, our investigators detail were made to the department from the different contracting uh, entities. Um, I appreciate the fact that a lot of this information is new to you and you've got to figure out what to do with it. Um, but we certainly have a volume of reports that went from contracting agencies uh, to the Department of Defense that detailed a variety of different levels of information regarding payoffs. Um, one memo uh, from one particular contractor uh, to a contract manager um, detailed, quote, he was approached by Taliban personnel to talk about payments for the safe passage of convoys through the area. That we've talked to other carriers that are making missions through those areas that are paying the Taliban for safe passage. According to another contract manager, everyone was aware of the issue of these protection payments. It, clearly something was missed in terms of the reports initially being made to contract managers and whether or not that information got up the chain. Can you just tell me what the obligation of contract managers are on the ground when they receive reports of, um, uh, of direct information of payoffs or potential payoffs to, uh, to, to, to varying levels of uh, the insurgency or Taliban. Um, what's the, just give me a sense of, of what the duty to report is and where we may have missed here. Sir, during my, my tenure as the, the CG for JCCIA on numerous occasions when information like that was presented, and it often was in Iraq and Afghanistan, I would call in the Procurement Fraud Task Force, uh, and normally it would be CID that I would task to go out, and can you validate the, the anecdotal evidence that you might be presented with when someone says that this might have occurred? Can you validate that this actually did occur? Can you investigate and use all the resources that they have at their hand? And once they complete their analysis and they present those findings to you, we would take the appropriate contractual remedies, and we did often to uh, make sure that we corrected the behavior and we held the prime contractor accountable for their performance. That's our fiduciary responsibility to the American taxpayer and required by our contract clauses. I guess my question is how does it, how does it get to you? What uh, level of obligation on uh, the contract managers that are potentially receiving this information is there to report what, what they're hearing from the field? So it would often come through the contractual chain of command, through the, uh, maybe through a COR, contracting officer representative to the contracting officer to the principal assist assistant responsible for contracting eventually in Afghanistan. And they would, uh, if it was significant enough, they would report it to me. And then they were, we would figure out a way ahead to pursue uh, the evidence and the allegation, teaming with potentially the Procurement Fraud Task Force or CID, whoever might be appropriate to do the research. In some cases, you might simply point a 15-6 officer to go out and do a commander's inquiry or investigation and report back. If it's serious enough, like the allegations that you're talking about, it would be CID. And there is an ongoing investigation by CID to look into the allegations. Uh, with respect to existing contract standards and um, Mr. Matsik, you referred to a, a sort of universal standard of conduct that's being developed for all PSCs. Um, what, what is the um, uh, what is the, the level of proof uh, that you need in order to take action? Do you need, um, what kind of level of evidence do you need that money has gone to a particular contractor and ended up in the hands of the Taliban or in the hands of the insurgents? Um, at what level is just knowledge that a particular contractor has relationships with Taliban or local insurgents enough to be able to take action or pull, um, or pull a particular contract? What's the level of proof we need here to take action? Uh, sir, you need a preponderance of evidence to show that or have a, a, a level of confidence that something did occur. Uh, and each case is different, so it would be difficult to talk about one case versus the other. I would simply rely upon the investigating official, whoever that might be, 
might be CID, might be FBI, and they would present you with that level of evidence. And then the, in my case, I had a legal staff that looked at everything that we executed in terms of action we would take against a contractor, and we would have the legal staff review it. In some cases, we might reach back to uh, the Army staff or to DOD to also leverage some of their experience and then take the appropriate action. But each case would be uh, different, sir. Just one last question, Mr. Chairman. Uh, do you need actual specific evidence of a direct and immediate payment being made, or is, uh, or is evidence of a link and association between a contractor and the Taliban, for instance, enough to be able to take action or to, to take or to pull, pull a particular contract? Sir, you would need facts, and facts might be a sworn statement. It might be two or three different individuals who might collaborate. Something had occurred. Uh, but you would have to have factual, fact-based evidence that something had occurred that you could take action against. And you know that it would, because uh, in our contracts, we, we uphold the federal acquisition regulations, which are derived by statute and law. And we also charge our contractors to uphold, in the case of Afghanistan, the government of Afghanistan's laws. So it would have, it would have to withstand the scrutiny of uh, our legal analysis. Thank you very much. Ms. Chu, you recognize five minutes. I find it uh, disturbing that uh, our budget for private security contractors is um, 2.16 billion, and that is such a large percentage of the uh, GDP of Afghanistan, which is 13 billion. It's one fifth of the GDP of the entire country of Afghanistan, and therefore this this money is a lucrative source of revenue for the people of Afghanistan. So my questions have to do with. Um, uh, with questioning whether a portion of our taxpayers' dollars are going to the Taliban. And so first let me ask uh, General Nichols Nicholson about uh, one summer 2008 incident where Commander Rahula's um, agents accompanying a host nation trucking contractor along Highway 1 allegedly tipped off insurgents at about an approaching convoy and were then allowed to pass unharmed before the insurgents attacked the convoy. Doesn't this suggest that Rahala, uh, who is responsible for the line share convoy security in southern, Afga uh, southern Afghanistan, that he has a working relationship with the Taliban? Yeah, ma'am, I, I would have to take uh, that incident and, and examine it. I don't have the details of that incident at my fingertips. If, if that was in the report we received this morning, we'll gladly uh, get together with our investigative team and country and further develop that and see if the investigative team can uh, can tell us what, what they found. Ma'am, could I, uh, if, if I could, sir, if I could make one clarification. The host nation trucking contract is $2.16 billion, but it's not just for pri private security contractors. The majority of that actually goes for the short and long haul uh, for the eight contractors that are serving every day. Uh, we increased it to $2.16 billion. The expenditure to date is about 700000 per day in terms of an average day what we would spend on truck operations. To date, since we awarded the contract in March of 2009, we've expended about $350 million against a ceiling of $2.16 billion. The contract will expire, uh, I believe, around April, May of 11. So we're about nine or ten months from expiration. It's very doubtful that we today will get to the ceiling of 2.16 billion, given the current burn rate of 700,000 per day. It was simply a ceiling that we knew or were assured that we could have the route number, the right number of trucks available to be able to deliver the equipment and supplies to war fighters. But it's doubtful today that we'll reach the ceiling. And your estimate of how much we actually will expend is what? Ma'am, I'll have to get back with you on that, but I could, uh, uh, we could look at it and do the math and look at the surge operations that are going to occur and then you, give you an estimate of where we might be in a year from now. But in my personal opinion, uh, I doubt if we'll get to a billion or much over a billion dollars in terms of execution by the end of the, the actual contract. But I'll get back with you with a more firm answer from JCCIA. I would have to say, though, that even if it's a billion, one billion versus 13 billion for the entire GDP of Afghanistan still is substantial. Um, 
General Nich- Nicholson, beyond the incident involving Rahala's agents uh, reportedly tipping off insurgents, several other host nation trucking contract contractors have stated that Rahala openly coordinates with and, and pays off Taliban insurgents to help secure safe passage when it's convenient for him to do so. And there was an incident report that was filed by a contractor in 2007 explicitly stating that a Taliban commander had demanded protection money for the safe passage of goods. Um, And a meeting of host nation trucking contract project managers requested greater armament authority from the Department of Defense to protect themselves and avoid paying an estimated 1.6 to 2 million per week to the insurgency. So even if a small percentage of this money is reaching the Taliban, what are the consequences are for our counterinsurgency strategy? Yes, ma'am. First off, uh, that would be unacceptable, U- U.S. taxpayer dollars going to the enemy. And it's something that every commander in Afghanistan certainly would be concerned about and would want to stop immediately. Uh, when we receive an- anecdotal intelligence reports or human intelligence, then we, th- those don't constitute evidence, as, as General Phillips described, but we take those and then we look for the linkages between criminal networks and the government, criminal networks and contracts, and pass that information to our investigative agencies to examine that so that we can then uh, take the appropriate action. And that may include referring it to the Afghan government for arrests. For example, we've recently uh, seen some arrests of, of Afghan general officers and the border police who have been engaged in corrupt practices. We've seen uh, arrests of uh, district police chiefs in RC South, for example, for drug running. So there is a nascent and growing capacity within the Afghan government to act against corrupt officials. Uh, but under no circumstances would the funneling of U.S. dollars to the enemy be acceptable to any of us. Uh, the, the key is uh, getting that information, developing it more fully, uh, and then being able to take the appropriate action. Uh, uh, another thing I wanted to follow up on, ma'am, that you mentioned earlier. We have tremendous potential with this money to have a positive effect on the Afghan economy. And so looking for ways to build capacity at the local level, encourage the growth of small businesses, uh, you know, reinvigorate local economies is, is paramount to the success of our COIN campaign. And so as we look at how we address uh, the uh, execution of our contracts, this is one of the objectives of Task Force 2010 is how to optimize the effect of dollars, not just to, to avoid or eliminate fraudulent activities, but how to optimize the effect of these dollars so they, in fact, enhance the overall effects that we're achieving with our investment in Afghanistan. Thank you, Ms. Chu. You know, uh, it's sort of amazing. Two days after this contract went into effect, there were a stream of complaints already filing. People were reporting. Uh, problems with uh, pay, who they were paying and having to pay off people to work on. And then uh, 25,000 documents that were replete with emails, with incident reports, uh, with reportings of situation where people thought they might be uh, payments to the insurgents. They were concerned about paying war laws. They were concerned about the corruptive effect. So to, to say that you know, now if we heard about it, we're going to go find out if it's real or not, we're going to try to get uh, enough evidence to prosecute, brings to mind a couple of points. One is it's been 14 months. You know, and you want to, you know, prove that, go out and talk to Commander Rahola, except he's never met anybody. He's never met a single person in the United States government where he would admit openly, as he did to the committee staff, yeah, I'm getting paid tens of millions of dollars to take care of a certain road over, over here. Yes, I drive around uh, with equipment that's not been approved or authorized in that. I don't even know about the rules that they have. And I'm paying off police and I'm paying off uh, members of the Afghan national uh, military as well. Uh, so I think there's been a lot to go on here and get people started on this thing uh, quite some time ago. Uh, you know, uh, General Phillips, I, I look at your statement. Well, actually, it was Mr. Motzak's statement here. Notwithstanding media coverage regarding incidents involving private security contractors, the frequency of serious incidents by DOD private security contractors is extraordinarily low. These numbers seem to demonstrate that on the whole, United States private security contractors are operating in accordance with the host nation laws and support for overall counterinsurgency objectives. That leads me to believe that you think just because there haven't been enough reports, that in and of itself is proof that everything's going just fine. The host nation laws are being complied with, our counterinsurgency strategy is intact, when in fact Commander Rahola says, I've lost 454 guys, I never filed a single report. Now the, your own rules and regulations require that every time there's an, an, a discharge they're supposed to be a report. Never mind every time that somebody dies. So obviously that isn't happening. This idea that there aren't any reports filed isn't conclusive evidence that that's the case. 
who is supposed to be responsible on the ground for actually having eyes on proof of whether or not there are checkpoints set up from time to time where there are bribes extracted for police or the national uh, military in Afghanistan. I mean, just because you don't get a report that it's happening doesn't mean that, you know, it may not be happening. In fact, you got reports, or I'm not saying you particularly, but all the way up and down the chain there are reports that it was happening. Uh, and yet nobody that I know of, not a contractor and not anybody in the military that's supposed to be charged with the responsibility of oversight, ever went out, except for one inf instance, a Colonel Lewis, went out about two or three hundred yards from the gate, and he said, when I got out there, it seemed that they changed their behavior and stopped doing what they were doing, but I wasn't allowed to go out again or go any further. So unless somebody's going out and seeing whether or not there are these checkpoints set up for bribes, unless somebody's going out and seeing a, a fellow like Rahula getting paid off gobs of money, uh, and then whether or not he's paying anybody else, whether or not you're going out, and we have a list here of 44 uh, different areas of the road said to be controlled by different people, Commander Mariula, Masud, Anga, Bamat, Masud, Sharb, Hababula, Koka, Turjan, and Rahula. Unless somebody's out there seeing that these people are getting paid or they otherwise wouldn't go through or whatever, who's responsible for doing that? Because you people may never hear about it further up the chain. But if we're not letting anybody go out and do periodic inspections, if we're not letting somebody go out and put eyes on, then I don't see how you can say you're managing and overseeing these contracts. You know, and just the fact that the contractors didn't rate incident reports, if that's how you reach a conclusion everything is fine, I think that's a, you know, that should be problematical to us on that. So, you know, I'll just leave that as a rhetorical question. I think the answer is pretty clear. But uh, General Nicholson, I'll say this to you. I understand everybody would think it's a terrible thing of the Taliban has been paid. Terrible thing of the Taliban has been paid. We all should be horrified to think that that might be happening. But isn't it also who's got hundreds of militia under his authority, controls good segments of area, and as to all those other people that I just read, isn't it also problematical that they're getting tens of millions of dollars by their own admission, uh, and that they have armies that don't answer to the Afghan government, never speak to our people, and just do whatever they want to do and are known as the butcher as they drive through towns? How does that affect our counterinsurgency strategy? Yes, sir. In the, in the existence of any uh, armed force that's not a part of the Afghan government, uh, eventually, as President Karzai stated, needs to go away. And the international community supports that. We support that. And it is counter to our counterinsurgency strategy in the sense that they're a surrogate for a lack of capacity on the part of the government. So clearly, sir, we want to get to an end state where we don't need private security uh, right. contractors because we've got sufficient security. But there were reports of security. this since two days after the contract started to be implemented. So where's the action? Where's the, you know, other than having reports, and you go through the documents over there, you say, well, if a contractor says, I reported it up, and I was told, well, they can't deal with that, the legal department said they'd have to rebid the contract, so they're not going to deal with it. Another reporter said, I reported it up, uh, and they said nothing they could do about it. Uh, you know, they, they just looked the other way. They were met with indifference, was what one contractor said. So for 14 months, well, less two days, you know, when we get started on that, where's been, other than an indifferent response or looking the other way or saying that it's a cost of doing business, where's the response? If you think it's a cost of doing business, if that's the legitimate argument that the Department of Defense wants to put forward, then where's the oversight and the management aspect to make sure the guys like Rahula aren't getting uh, enriched and having militias out there with competing interests from the Afghan government in the United States? Where's the enforcement, the management, the oversight to make sure that the ANP and the ANA aren't getting paid off? Uh, and we just don't see that happening. And 14 months later, that's why I think the report is, is as disturbing as it is. Sir, I can, I can make, let me just add a couple of data points, uh, sir. One of the issues we've had, a particular many of these reports I noticed in your in your write-up were uh, focused in the southern region of Afghanistan, a new area for American forces. We began last year with adding 20,000 troops there. We're adding another 15,000 this year. These additional troops enable us to partner with the Afghan security forces. Additionally, we're roughly doubling the size of the Afghan National Army and significantly increasing the size of the police in the southern region. Okay, can I just interrupt you there? Yes, you wish. I don't mean to be a wise guy when I say that, but we've, we've been out there and looked at the, the training programs yes, for sir. the military and the police, and you may well, you want to double them, but you may want to give us a projection of when you think there's any realistic prospect that they're going to be doubled with the capacity to actually accomplish the missions they'll be assigned. Yes, sir. They, they, they've needed to be doubled for, for a long time. I, w one of the points I wanted to add, sir, was it, it's through the partnering with Afghan police in particular. Our goal is to curb and limit and eventually 
to the extent we can eliminate these corrupt practices that you're referring to, these illegal checkpoints, by partnering with Afghan units, by having sufficient ISAF forces and sufficient numbers of Afghan forces that are properly trained. And of course, the Afghan police, uh, in the time frame we're discussing last year, 70 percent of them were not even trained. They had uniforms, they had guns, but they're on the road. They, they have low pay, they're not properly trained, and they're engaged in these corrupt practices. Through, through the efforts, through the funding provided by the U.S. Congress and the efforts of the, of the NATO training mission in Afghanistan, we've now increased the amount of training. We're, we're eventually going to eliminate that deficit of untrained police, and we're going to be able to partner with the police units and increase accountability and increase their professional standards. And this is one of the approaches towards uh, elimination of these illegal checkpoints, which would be shaking down the drivers, which would result in these, in these things that your report rightly uh, pointed I out. I hope that what you say about training them and getting them up to capacity is, is going to happen on that. Uh, we've, as I said, we've looked at this in the past. We've done reports on that, investigated, and I, I suspect we'll have to go out again and take a look on it, because the concern is that they're not really uh, the retention rates are difficult and, uh, and the success rates are difficult. But I don't want to take up all Mr. Flake's time. Mr. Flake. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If I might borrow this, uh, this is in the report. This is the list that the Chairman read from that uh, the uh, security contractors enlist who controls which miles of the road. Are you aware of how many miles or, or any in particular that are controlled by the Afghan security forces? Mr. Mossack? No, sir. That was the first time I, I saw that chart. The, uh, so uh, aside we, from the chart, are we aware are there are certain areas? We, 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 we are aware that, uh, and it goes back to what, what's in the report, uh, uh, I think it's, it's safe to say that virtually everything in the report uh, was, in fact, reported to, uh, to many authorities. Uh, I'm sure that most, most of it was uh, investigated by the appropriate uh, task forces or is being invest investigated by the appropriate task forces. But the, the, the reality is, is that we may not have gotten to a level of, of evidence that permits us to do something in every case that would, uh, that would, would meet the requirement. Clearly, the information in general has come forward. The Secretary of State made the comment that's in the in the preface of your report. The Secretary of Defense has said we're concerned about corruption. The UN does a survey and inside the urban areas of, uh, of Afghanistan, the number one issue is corruption. 59% of the nation cares about it. Uh, we, we've got it. The uh, well, uh, Admiral Dassault is over there with a new, another additional task force with forensic accountants, not just accountants, but forensic accountants to try to try to track the dollars. I would caution you that that uh, one of the frustrations I have, I, I used to be a part-time policeman in New Jersey, and I know it's with talking to my old uh, detective buddies how difficult it was to get a case against organized crime. It took years, and that was an environment with a, with a baseline banking system, a baseline pay system, baseline telecommunication system. We're doing this in another environment where uh, it's not going to happen, in my estimation, overnight. But I assure you, we're taking it all seriously. I, I, I would be as frustrated as you are that you've seen the issues being reported and you don't see an effect right. being occurred very, very quickly. But, That's uh, the frustration. Uh, yeah, I, I realize that. that. Uh, well, I, I, if I, I was a cop on the other side, I'd say, damn it, I'm doing what I can with what I got. This so, investigation has been going on for six months, the, the committee's investigation, yes. uh, yet there seems to be very little awareness. In fact, we only got last week any indication that the Department of Defense was doing really anything on the subject, and, and that was just in the form of a PowerPoint presentation about, uh, but, but we, as the chairman mentioned, there's very little evidence that uh, people are moving outside of the security gates or that they're, that you're taking reports of uh, of uh, casualties or uh, fire uh, that that have to be under our law reported, we either assume, we either have to say we're taking those reports that are ignoring them, or assuming that there's no bad actors out there or none of this happening. It can't be both. But let me, let me just ask uh, General Nicholson. Nicholson, you mentioned that this, if this activity were occurring, these payoffs to warlords, a parallel authority structure outside of the Afghan government that that is counter to our coin strategy in Afghanistan. At what point do we say, 
if these allegations are true, if half of these allegations are true, if a tenth of these allegations are true in this report, or the findings in this report, that we have to adjust our strategy because this runs so counter uh, to the coin strategy. At, at what point, where is the tipping point there? At what point will we, as a committee that has oversight here, uh, hear the Department of Defense simply say, hey, this is just the cost of doing business and it's more important to move goods and services or we simply can't tolerate this kind of parallel authority structure outside of the Afghan government operating in the countryside. Yes, sir. Our, our activities uh, to counter corruption are central to the campaign, uh, and and we have we're engaging at all levels of our of our government, as you know, uh, President Obama with President Karzai, all the way down to the uh, U.S. units partnered with police inside Kandahar City, trying to improve performance and accountability with their Afghan partners. So so this is a is a high priority for us. Well, let, let me just say we we hear that on the top. We hear the statement that's in the report, uh, Secretary Clinton. We've heard the statements in the report that President Obama has said. We see this uh, report, all of these findings, this overwhelming evidence from this investigation that this is occurring, yet in the middle, from those who have authority to address the situation, actually on the ground, by amending a contract or stripping somebody of the contract or making sure that uh, this is not occurring, we don't see any activity there. And that's where the frustration lies. I, I'm out of time, but Sir, uh, you want to yes. Sir, if I may, uh, you, a particular contractor who you've raised by name a couple of times, a uh, large contractor, private security contractor uh, in Afghanistan, in part the reason that the uh, next twist contract, which was going to be the large private security contract, uh, bundled contract, if you will, uh, which would have made it easier for the contracting agency to manage the contract, uh, that process was killed and they're going back to individual awards for contract, in part because that particular individual was perceived to have uh, a nationwide advantage if we awarded a contract nationally. And so we're going back to, uh, to local, local awards of, of uh, private security contracts as opposed to a nationwide award. So uh, there, is, there is knowledge and there is a cause and effect in some areas because of this. Sir, would it be possible for me to cover a couple of things where we have taken some action real quick? Uh, sir, contracting officer representatives, we've talked a little bit about that and alluded to them from time to time. About less than a month from me arriving into theater, I knew that we had an issue or problem with contracting officer representatives. And I met with uh, the commanding general of Army Material Command and the Army Acquisition Executive, who before I went to Iraq was my boss. And we knew that we had issues and, and problems. And we took that on as an Army. And we've made, I think, great strides in contracting officer representatives. And that also includes the pieces where people are monitoring what's happening with host nation trucking. Uh, the Army has executed uh, or issued an execution order for CORs in December of 2009 that requires a brigade to have up to 80 CORs trained and and uh, receiving a certificate to be able to perform COR functions on a various contract. That's a great advancement or improvement from where we were 18 months ago. And we continue to make improvements with CORs. I've had personal discussions with three division commanders before they deployed into Iraq. And sir, the other point I wanted to make, make sure you're aware that where we are taking great st strides is some co subcontractor management. The committee has talked a lot about that piece. Uh, I spoke to the JCCIA commander uh, just this week and have an ongoing dialogue with her. They are now putting forth a new clause that will go into our contracts in Afghanistan and potentially in Iraq, I believe, that will give us greater visibility into subcontractors to include the private security contractors that would work on a host nation trucking contract. It would give us greater visibility into banking uh, and financial efforts visibility into that so we might be able to see if there is some kind of activity occurring uh, I think uh, that is still in review but I suspect that we'll have something in place that will begin to put in our contracts very soon well, thank you for that and, but I'd make two points that one is none of your COR as you call them ever get outside the gate okay 
uh, and the JCCIA now is going to fix up the legal paperwork on that, and that's good. That's a step in the right direction. But unless somebody actually gets out to check and see whether or not that's being complied with, it leaves us right back in the same boat on that. And I, I just want to take a quick issue. A, a couple of times it's, it's been inferred, maybe intentionally or not intentionally, that, you know, geez, if we just had the hard facts, we'd have been able to do something on that. It took one email to Watan Risk Management to set up an interview with both of the principals of that company, both of whom have done jail time in the United States, incidentally, before they, they got their present position, and to have them bring along Commander Rahula to an interview with the committee staff, where he then readily admitted the, that he was making huge piles of money and had an extraordinarily large militia, that he was driving around with uh, weaponry that wasn't allowable without authorization, uh, that he basically controlled areas of the road and knew other people who controlled area, other parts of different roads and what their conduct had been, and that he had paid off certain members of the ANA and the ANP and would name names for everybody. So it wasn't like it wasn't out there for somebody to get. I just want to make that point. Uh, Mr. Welch, if, if you have five minutes, uh, I welcome you to it. Uh, th thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, General Nicholson uh, is a former commander in the South. Uh, my question to you is, do you believe it's sufficient for us to wait until there is a criminal indictment and the completion of a criminal investigation? Or is there a core strategic decision that needs to be made uh, more promptly? Sir, it's uh, clearly if, as we learn these lessons, we need to integrate them uh, so we can improve our performance. Uh, and, and this is one of the reasons why the chairman chartered Task Force 2010 was to bring in another set of eyes, uh, Admiral Kathleen Dassault, who had been a former commander of the contracting command with a group of subject matter experts to to enable the command to really focus on this issue and very quickly generate, number one, effects in the South, so their initial focus is Kandahar, and how we can then begin to achieve this effect I mentioned earlier of optimizing contracting in support of the COIN campaign at Kandahar. So that will be their initial focus, and that was uh, designated as such in order to more directly link these lessons learned and best practices and get them into the uh, the ongoing campaign. So, so clearly we want to move as quickly as possible. Having said that, sir, it's also important to achieve these prosecutions to enable the Afghans to develop the kind of capacity they need to arrest and prosecute these folks. And, and to date they have arrested and, and are prosecuting uh, a handful of senior officers in the border police and, and well, the uh, Afghan police. Uh, all right, thank you. But, you know, again, I, I go back to what I think is a fundamental question as to whether or not uh, the long-term goals uh, of the United States uh, that are being, uh, 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 where the, our military is the one who been, are being asked to carry out and execute on those long-term goals is better served by uh, putting the security of these convoys under the direct supervision of our commander uh, and the direct protection of our soldiers who we know are accountable uh, versus $2 billion that's getting spread out and then we try to rely on lawyering up in criminal prosecutions. But that's, that's my statement and I know that's not the decision that you've, you've made. Uh, but Mr. Mostek, let me read you something. According to Lieutenant Colonel David Elwell, the commander of the 484th Joint Movement Control Battalion that was in charge of overseeing and managing the host nation trucking contract in Afghanistan, the battalion didn't have the vehicles, the weaponry, or the manpower to carry out oversight. It just didn't have what it needed, and they're stretched thin. I understand that. Uh, but they couldn't travel along the Afghan roads because it would have been in his Quote, quoting him, a combat mission. And also, in the Department of Defense instruction issued in April stated that, quote, security is inherently governmental if it is to be, be performed in environments where there is such a high likelihood of hostile fire by groups using sophisticated weapons and devices that in the judgment of the military commander, the situation could evolve into combat, unquote. And according to the Congressional Research Service, private security contractors working for the Department of Defense in Afghanistan are more than 4.5 times more likely to be killed in action uh, than even U.S. military personnel. Uh, that number is even higher for private security companies provided, uh, providing convoy service. So the question I have, Mr. Mostek, is that in light of these uh, statistics, can you explain 
what you meant in your statement when you said that the roles of the private security contractors providing convoy security, quote, are analogous to civilian security guard forces, not combat forces. So I can't comment on the numbers by CRS, but uh, four point times more likely, I, I, just on the raw numbers, based upon what I know of casualties, it doesn't track, but that notwithstanding, uh, first off, it goes back to my initial comment where the, the force protection mission, the force protection requirement is that of the commander. The commander makes the assessment and has to, and is responsible for the risk assessment. The guards that guard both movement and static uh, positions in Afghanistan are just that. They are guards. They have no authority to execute any sort of combat role. A, a, a great many of the incidents that we are talking about today, in normal sense, are considered criminal elements, not a military enemy in, in the traditional sense. We're talking about warlords attacking uh, Attacking other, these are criminal elements that are that are engaged. They're not force so you, on you, force military. I mean, again, I I don't have your experience and I don't have your knowledge, but I do uh, appreciate that if we don't get those supplies to our troops, our troops are going to be in peril. And I would think it's a standard tactic of the enemies of our troops, the ones who want to do them harm, that they would frequently uh, use as a tactic trying to cut off their supply. I mean, isn't and that leads to combat, correct? Well, it, it, it's an action. Ye yes, sir, it's an action. Uh, well, is it, does this whole policy depend on whether the folks who are uh, killing uh, and attacking, killing the security folks and attacking the convoys that are destined to serve our troops, whether they're doing it for criminal purpose or for a, uh, a, a Taliban uh, no, war no, purpose? Sir, no, sir, but, but, but the preponderance are more criminal than they are, than they are Taliban. Okay. And Again, it, we, we cannot guarantee no attack. We, no, I, we I understand, understand that. that. And we, and I, we, I don't. I, I just want to again reiterate. I think there's a fundamental strategic question here about whether we want to give two billion dollars to folks uh, who have no particular motivation other than to make money, uh, uh, versus have that be under control of our troops, particularly when that that alternative force is ultimately going to be, in my, uh, I, I think in the opinion of some, a threat to capacity building uh, of the Afghan army and the Afghan government. Thank uh, you, Mr. Wells. Thank you. Thank Yield you very back. much. Let me ask if you gentlemen would be willing to answer uh, further questions that might be asked in writing at some point in time, if we give you time to do that. Yes, I'd sir. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, also, I just want to run through a couple of things. Following up on Ms. Wells, if, in fact, the United States decides to continue on this way of using small armies of private security contractors to defend the, the supply chain in the war zone. Has there been any discussion, uh, or can we expect any discussion, about getting direct authority and accountability over the private security companies as opposed to going to them as subcontractors? Does anybody know if that's being considered? Sir, part of my, uh, I can share this, part of my answer before on the subcontractor clause mm -hmm. would give us visibility into the subcontractor yeah, but both we'll separate privy. them out from the trucking companies and so you get the trucking companies going one way, the contractors who really don't have any expertise in this area, and then also be directly in charge of these uh, security people. You mean go directly to a private yeah. security contractor? So to the military, contract you know, they'll be directly re responsible to our military as security people, not through a, a trucking contractor, not passing it off to the trucking contractors who seem perfectly incapable of doing it. Sir, in my capacity, I'm going to force that consideration to be made. Good. Thank you. And I know you've already talked, at least General Nicholson has, about potential future role of the Afghan National uh, Forces on that. Uh, you've already talked also about uh, contract transparency with the subcontractors. We appreciate that. Uh, we still, I think, need to work on the oversight and the management, getting people outside the gate and getting their eyes on on that. Uh, and I, I think I heard everybody say, and I'll ask General Nicholson again one more time, is there a conversation going on now at the Department of Defense uh, about the effects of coalition contracting on Afghan corruption. Is that larger strategic conversation going on? Yes, sir, it is. Okay. I want to thank all of you for taking your time and, and bringing your expertise and information to the committee, and uh, we appreciate it a great deal, as well as your uh, agreement that you'll answer further questions in writing. And, and with that, we're going to take about a five-minute recess. And again, thank you.
This morning on Washington Journal, we talk to National Journal correspondent James Kitfield about General Stanley McChrystal's criticisms of President Obama. Congress